Chapter 15 of Strange Pages from Family Papers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Strange Pages from Family Papers by T. F. Thistleton Dyer. Chapter 15 Romance of Wealth. The Unsunned Heaps of Miser's Treasure. Milton. Stories of lost or unclaimed property have always possessed a fascinating charm, but unfortunately the links for providing the rightful ownership break off generally at the point where its history seems on the verge of being unraveled. At the same time, however romantic and improbable some of the announcements relating to such treasure hoards may seem, there is no doubt that many a poor family at present day would be possessed of great wealth if it could only gain a clue to the whereabouts of money rightfully its own. The legal identification, too, of such property when discovered has frequently precluded its successfully being claimed by those really entitled to enjoy it, and few persons are aware of the enormous amount of unclaimed money, amounting to some millions, which lies dormant, although continually made public in the agony columns of the Times and other daily newspapers. It should also be remembered that wealth of this kind is carefully preserved in all kinds of places, bankers' cellars, for instance, containing some of the most curious unclaimed deposits, many of them being of rare intrinsic value, whilst others are of great romantic interest. Thus, not many years ago, there was accidentally discovered in the vaults of the Bank of England a large chest of some considerable age, which, on being removed from its resting place, almost fell to pieces. On the contents of this old chest being examined, some massive plate of the time of Charles the Second was brought to light, of very beautiful and chaste workmanship. Nor was this all. For much to the surprise of the explorers, a bundle of love letters written during the period of the Restoration was found carefully packed away with the plate. On search being made by the directors of the bank in their books, the surviving heir of the original depositor was ascertained to whom the plate and packet of love letters were handed over. Many similar cases might be quoted. For in most of our bank sellers are hoarded away family treasures, which for some inexplicable reason have never been claimed. Some, again, of our old jewellers' shops have had strange deposits in their cellars, the history and whereabouts of their owners having baffled the most searching and minute inquiries. As an illustration, may be given an instance which occurred some years back in connection with a jewellers' shop near Soho, it seems that an old lady lodged for a few weeks over the said shop, and, on leaving for the continent, left behind her for safety's sake several boxes of plate to be taken care of until further notice. But years passed by and no tidings of the lady reached the jeweller, although from time to time the most careful inquiries were instituted. At last, however, it transpired that she had died somewhat suddenly, but as no record was found amongst her papers relating to the boxes of plate, a lengthened litigation arose as to the rightful claimant of the property. Occasionally, through domestic differences, homes are broken up and the members dispersed, some perhaps going abroad. In many cases, such persons, it may be, are not only lost sight of for years, but are never heard of again, and hence, when they become entitled to money, Large sums are frequently spent in advertising for their whereabouts, and oftentimes with no satisfactory results. Indeed, advertisements for missing relatives are, it is said, yearly on the increase, and considerable sums of money cannot be touched owing to the uncertainty as to whether persons of this description are alive or dead. An interesting instance occurred in the year 1882, when Sir James Hannan had the following case brought before him. Council applied on behalf of Augustus Alexander de Niceville for letters of administration to the property of his father, supposed to be dead, as he had not been heard of since the year 1831, and who, if alive, would be 105 years old. In early life he held a commission in the French army, 
but in the year 1826 he came to this country and settled in Devonshire. On the breaking out of the French Revolution he returned with his wife to France, but his wife came back to England and corresponded with her husband till the year 1831, when she ceased to hear from him. In spite of every means employed for tracing his whereabouts, nothing was ever heard of him, his wife dying in the year 1875. Affidavits in support of these facts having been read, the application was granted. Then there are the well-known unclaimed funds in Chancery, concerning which so much interest attaches. It may not be generally known what a mine of wealth these dormant funds constitute, amounting to many millions. Indeed, the royal courts of justice have been mainly built with the surplus interest of this money, and occasionally large sums from this fund have been borrowed to enable the Chancellor of the Exchequer to carry through his financial operations. By an act passed in the year 1865, facilities are afforded to apply one million pounds from funds standing in the books of the Bank of England to an account thus designated, account of securities purchased with surplus interest arising from securities carried to the account of monies placed out for the benefit and better security of the suitors of the Court of Chancery. Not so very long ago the subject was discussed in Parliament, when it was urged that, as the government were trustees of these funds, something should be done, as far as possible, by publicity, to adopt measures whereby the true owners might become claimants if they had but the knowledge of their rights. Another reason for money remaining unclaimed for a number of years is through missing wills. Hence many a family forfeits its claim to certain property on account of the testator's last wishes not being forthcoming. Thackeray makes one of his plots hang in a most ingenious way upon a missing will, which is discovered eventually in the sword-box of a family coach, and various curious instances are on record of wills having been discovered years after the testator's death, in the most out-of-the-way and unlikely hiding-places. In some cases also, through a particular clause in a will being peculiarly or doubtfully worded, heirs have been deprived of what was really due to them, a goodly part of the property having been squandered and wasted in prolonged legal expenses. Then again, it is universally acknowledged that there is an immense quantity of money and other valuables concealed in the earth. In olden days, the householder was the guardian of his own money, and so had to conceal it as his ingenuity could devise. Accordingly, large sums of money were frequently buried underground, and in excavating old houses, treasures of various kinds are oftentimes found but underneath the floors. The custom of making the earth a stronghold, and confiding to its safe-keeping deposits of money, prevailed until a comparatively recent period, and was only natural when it is remembered how, in consequence of civil commotions, many a home was likely to be robbed of its most valuable belongings. Hence every precaution was taken, a circumstance which accounts for the cunning secretal of rich and costly relics in old buildings. According to an entry given by Pepys in his diary, a large amount was supposed to be buried in his day, and he gives an amusing account of the hiding of his own money by his wife and father, when the Dutch fleet was supposed to be in the Medway. Times of trouble, therefore, will account for many of the treasures which were so carefully secreted in olden times. Many years ago, as the foundations of some old houses in Exeter were being removed, a large collection of silver coins was discovered, the money found dating from the time of Henry VIII to Charles I, or the Commonwealth, and it has been suggested that the disturbed state of affairs in the middle of the seventeenth century led to this mode of securing treasure. This will account in some measure for the traditions of the existence of large sums of hidden money associated with some of our old family mansions. An amusing story is related by Thomas Walsingham, which dates as far back as the 14th century. A certain Saracen physician came to Earl Warren to ask permission to kill a dragon which had its den at Bromfield, near Ludlow, and committed great ravages in the Earl's lands. The dragon was overcome but it transpired that a large treasure lay hid in its den. 
Thereupon some men of Herefordshire went by night to dig for the gold, and had just succeeded in reaching it, when the retainers of the Earl of Warren, having learnt what was going on, captured them and took possession of the hoard for the Earl. A legend of this kind was long connected with Holm Hall, formerly a seat of a branch of the Presswich family. It seems that during the civil wars its then owner, Sir Thomas Presswich, was very much impoverished by fines and sequestrations, so that he was forced to sell the mansion and estate to Sir Oswald Mosley. On more than one occasion his mother had induced him to advance large sums of money to Charles I and his adherents, under the assurance that she had hidden treasures which would amply repay him. This hoard was generally supposed to have been hidden, either in the hall itself, or in the grounds adjoining, and it was said to be protected by spells and incantations, known only to the Lady Dowager herself. Time passed on, and the old lady became every day more infirm, and at last she was struck down with apoplexy before she could either practice the requisite incantations, or inform her son where the treasure was secreted. After her burial, diligent search was made, but to no effect and Sir Thomas Presswich went down to the grave in comparative poverty. Since that period, fortune-tellers and astrologers have tried their powers to discover the whereabouts of this hidden hoard, and, although they have been unsuccessful, it is still believed that one day their labors will be rewarded, and that the demons who guard the money will be forced to give up their charge. Some years ago, the hall and estate were sold to the Duke of Bridgewater, and, the site having been required for other purposes, the hall was pulled down, but no money was discovered. In Ireland, there are few old ruins in and about which excavations have not been made in the expectation of discovering hidden wealth, and in some instances the consequence of this belief has been the destruction of the building, which has been actually undermined. About three miles south of Cork, near the village of Douglas, is a hill castle called Castle Treasure, where a cross of gold was supposed to be concealed, and the discovery, some years ago, of a rudely formed clay urn and two or three brazen implements attracted for some time crowds to the spot. But such stories are not confined to any special locality and there is in most parts of England a popular belief that vast treasures are hidden beneath the old ruins of many houses, and that supernatural obstacles always prevent their being discovered. Indeed, Scotland has numerous legends of this kind, some of which, as Mr. Chambers has pointed out, have been incorporated into its popular rhymes. Thus, on a certain farm in the parish of Les Mahagau, from time immemorial there existed a tradition that beneath a very large stone was secreted a vast treasure in the shape of a kettleful, a bootful, and a bullhideful of gold, all of which have been designated Katie Nevy's hoard, having given rise to the following adage. Between Diller Hill and Crossford there lies Katie Nevy's hoard. And at Fardell, anciently the seat of Sir Walter Raleigh's family, in the courtyard formerly stood an inscribed bilingual stone of the Roman British period. The stone is now in the British Museum. The tradition current in the neighbourhood makes the inscription refer to a treasure buried by Sir Walter Raleigh, and hence the local rhyme. Between this stone and Fardell Hall lies as much money as the devil can haul. A curious incident happened in Ireland about the commencement of the last century. The Bishop of Derry, being at dinner, there came in an old Irish harper, and sang an ancient song to his harp. The Bishop, not being acquainted with Irish, was at a loss to understand the meaning of the song, but on inquiry he ascertained the substance of it to be this, that in a certain spot a man of gigantic stature lay buried, and that over his breast and back were plates of pure gold, and on his fingers rings of gold so large that an ordinary man might creep through them. The spot was so exactly described that two persons actually went in quest of the garden treasure. After they had dug for some time, they discovered two thin pieces of gold, circular, and more than two inches in diameter. But when they renewed their excavations on the following morning, they found nothing more. 
The song of the harper has been identified as Moiva Bob, and the lines which suggested the remarkable discovery have been translated thus. In earth, beside the loud cascade, the son of Sora's king was laid, and on each finger placed a ring of gold by mandate of our king. The loud cascade was the well-known waterfall of Ballyshannon, known as the Salmon Leap now. It was also a common occurrence for a miser to hide away his hoards underground, and before he had an opportunity of making known their whereabouts, he died, without his heirs being put in the necessary possession of the information regarding that part of the earth wherein he had kept secreted his wealth. At different times in old houses have been discovered misers' hoards, and which, but for some accident, would have remained buried in their forgotten resting-place. This will frequently account for money being found in the most eccentric nooks, an illustration of which happened a few years ago in Paris, when a miser died, leaving behind him, as was supposed, money to the value of sixty pounds. After some months had passed by, the claimant to the property made his appearance, and, on the miser's apartments being thoroughly searched, no small astonishment was caused by the discovery of the large sum of thirty-two thousand pounds. It may be noted that in former years our forefathers were extremely fond of hiding away their money for safety, making use of the chimney or the wainscot or skirting board. There it frequently remained, and such depositories of the family wealth were occasionally, from death and other causes, completely forgotten. In one of Hogarth's well-known pictures, the young spendthrift, who has just come into his inheritance, is being measured by a fashionable tailor, when, from behind the panels which the builders are ripping down, is seen falling a perfect shower of golden money. There can be no doubt that there is many an old house in this country which, if thoroughly ransacked, would be found to contain treasures of the most valuable and costly kind. Some years ago, for example, a collection of pictures was discovered at Merton College, Oxford, hidden away between the ceiling and the roof, and missing deeds have, from time to time, been discovered located in all sorts of mysterious nooks. In a set of rooms in Magdalen College, too, which had been originally occupied by one of the fellows, and had subsequently been abandoned and devoted to lumber, was unearthed a strong wooden box, containing, together with some valuable articles of silver plate, a beautiful loving cup, with a cover of pure gold. When also the vicarage house of Ormsby in Yorkshire required reparation, some stonework had to be removed in order to carry out the necessary alterations, in the course of which a small box was found, measuring about a foot square, which had been embedded in the wall. The box, when opened, was full of angels, angelettes, and nobles. Some of the money was of the reign of Edward IV, some of Henry VI, and some too of the reigns of Henry VII and Henry VIII. It has been suggested that when Henry VIII dissolved the lesser monasteries, the monks of Guysborough Priory, which was only about six miles off, fearing the worst, fled with their treasures, and, with the craft and cunning peculiar to their order, buried a portion of them in the walls of the parsonage house of Ormsby. To quote another case, Dunsford, in his Memories of Tiverton, 1790, page 285, speaking of the village of Chediscombe, says that in the middle of the sixteenth century, in the north part of the village, was a chapel in Tyre, dedicated to St. Mary. The walls and roof are still whole, and served some years past for a dwelling-house, but is now uninhabited. It appears that not only was there some superstition attaching to this building, which accounted for its untenanted condition, but certain money was supposed to be hidden away, to discover which every attempt had hitherto been in vain. It was therefore proposed, says the author, that some person should lodge in the chapel for a night to obtain preternatural information respecting it. 
Two persons at length complied with the request to do so, and, aided by strong beer, approached about nine o'clock the hallowed walls. They trembled exceedingly at the sudden appearance of a white owl that flew from a broken window with the message that considerable wealth lay in certain fields that if they would diligently dig there, they would undoubtedly find it. They quickly attended to this piece of information and employed a body of workmen who, before long, succeeded in bringing to light the missing money. A similar tradition was associated with Branzil Castle, a stronghold of great antiquity, situated in a romantic position about two miles from the Herefordshire Beacon. The story goes that the ghost of Lode Beauchamp, who died in Italy, could never rest until his bones were delivered to the right heir of Branzil Castle. Accordingly, they were sent from Italy enclosed in a small box, and were for a considerable time in the possession of Mr. Sheldon of Abberton. The tradition further states that the old castle of Branzil was moated round, and in that moat a black crow, presumed to be an infernal spirit, sat to guard a chest of money, till discovered by the rightful owner. The chest could never be moved, without the mover being in possession of the bones of Lord Beauchamp. Such stories of hidden wealth being watched over by phantom beings are not uncommon, and remind us of those anecdotes of treasures concealed at the bottom of wells, guarded over by the white ladies. In Shropshire, there is an old buried well of this kind, at the bottom of which a large hoard has long been supposed to lie hidden, or, as a local rhyme expresses it, near the brook of Bell there is a well, which is richer than any man can tell. In the south of Scotland it is the popular belief that vast treasures have for many a year past been concealed beneath the ruins of a hermitage castle. But, as they are supposed to be in the keeping of the evil one, they are considered beyond redemption. At different times various efforts have been made to dig for them, yet somehow the elements always on such occasions contrived to produce an immense storm of thunder and lightning, and deterred the adventurers from proceeding, otherwise, of course, the money would long ago have been found. And to give another of these strange family legends may be quoted one told of Stokesay Castle, Shropshire. It seems that many years ago all the country in the neighbourhood of Stokesay belonged to two giants who lived, the one upon View Edge and the other at Norton Camp. The story, commonly current, is that they kept all their money locked up in a big oak chest in the vaults under Stokesay Castle, and when either of them wanted any of it, he just took the key and got some. But one day one of them wanted the key, and the other had got it, so he shouted to him to throw it over, as they had been in the habit of doing, and he went to throw it, but somehow he made a mistake and threw too short, and dropped the key into the moat down by the castle, where it has remained ever since. And the chest of treasure stands in the vault still, but no one can approach it, for there is a big raven always sitting on the top of it, and he won't allow anybody to try and break it open, so no one will ever be able to get the giant's treasure until the key is found, and many say it never will be found, let folks try as much as they please. Amongst further reasons for the hiding away of money may be noticed eccentricity of character or mental delusion, a singular incident of which occurred some years ago. It appears that whilst some workmen were grubbing up certain trees at Tufnell Park near Highgate, they came upon two jars containing nearly four hundred pounds in gold. This they divided, and shortly afterwards, when the lord of the manor claimed the whole as treasure trove, the real owner suddenly made his appearance. In the course of inquiry it transpired that he was a brass founder, living at Clerkenwell, and having been about nine months before under a temporary delusion, he one night secreted the jars in a field at Tufnell Park. On proving the truth of his statement, the money was refunded to him. End of chapter 15